Hi, I'm Mary Mancini, your Tennessee Democratic Party chair. And this is If You Don't Know, Now You Know, a TNDP podcast. Recorded live from the Tennessee State Capitol in Nashville, we'll be speaking with lawmakers, activists, and candidates, people who can tell you and show you how the laws are made that affect our lives. There's no shortage of issues to be covered about freedom, opportunity, equity, justice, and safety. And we'll hustle to keep you in the loop. Hey there, it's Mary Mancini, your Tennessee Democratic Party chair. And this is If You Don't Know, Now You Know, a TNDP podcast. Today, we're diving deep into vouchers and public education with Tennessee Education Association President Beth Brown. Welcome, Beth. Hi, thanks, Mary. So you are the president of the Tennessee Educators Association. From here on out, we will just say TEA. Mm hmm. And before we do dive into these very important issues surrounding public education like vouchers, can you tell us what the TEA is and how the organization works to advance public education in Tennessee? I'm happy to. The Tennessee Education Association is the largest professional organization in the state of Tennessee. It is an association of educators for educators and by educators. We are governed by practitioners. So that I'm a licensed teacher here in Tennessee on leave from my classroom to serve in this role. We are governed by a board of directors who are elected from across the state to represent the various stakeholders from classroom teachers to education support professionals, administrators, state special schools, higher education, you know, we run the gamut. So we try to make sure that all educator interests are included. And we are the the governing body. We are we are the ones who drive the agenda. And then we have staff who then implement that agenda. And what's your role as president? So if you think about the organization as like a company, the president is the CEO. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Woohoo, CEO. <laughs> it sounds very fancy. <laughs> uh, what was your path here? How did you get to become the president of the TEA? So I am a high school English teacher from Grundy County. I had seven. Grundy in the house. Yeah. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah. So a, a very small district, rural district. I had 17 years in the classroom before taking leave to serve in this role. Both of my parents were educators. And I remember my mama telling me on my very first day of in-service to go join the association. And I remember joining because my mama told me to because I'm a Southern girl and that's what we do. <laughs> but I, I stayed because... Your mama's always right. Right. Uh, but I stayed because what I found in TEA was an organization that was not only advocating for me as an educator, but also for my students. And as a product of the Grundy County Public Schools, I faced a lot of challenges in college, not academically, but when I realized that I had not had the same opportunities or resources that my peers in my classes had had, it really made me think about why. Why did I not have those same opportunities? And so when I wound up teaching back in my hometown and I saw that cycle continuing with my students, I wanted to be a part of an organization who was going to advocate for me as their teacher, but also for my students to make sure that they had equal access access and equal opportunities. That's why I joined. A few years into my career, I was actually asked if I was interested in running for the state board of directors. I had only been teaching about seven or eight years and was asked to run. And I did. I ran and was elected to represent a very large rural district that runs from Kentucky to Alabama. It's about 16 rural districts and a couple of uh, municipal districts in there. Wow. Um, so in my late 20s, I joined the TEA Board of Directors and served for three years. And when I termed out at age well, I, I was in my early 30s and I was terming out and I thought it's 2012 and I thought I have a lot to offer and I, there's so much more work to do. It seems a shame to just go back to Grundy County and hide out. Mm. So I thought about how could I continue my journey and made the decision to run for vice president. So in the spring of 2014, I was elected vice president of the TEA, took office July 1. I served as our vice president for four years. So I served two terms before running for president was elected president in 2018 and took office July 1 of 2018. Wow. So you mentioned just briefly, I want to go back to this, some of the inherent problems in rural mm -hmm. schools here yeah. in Tennessee. Yeah. But it's not just rural communities, right? They're, what are the differences that you see the problems in rural versus the problems in suburban or city schools? So I think that's been one of the greatest realizations in my professional career, that a lot of the problems are the same. 
I remember going to a conference one time, and it was actually one of TA's conferences. It's our Ethnic Minority Affairs Conference. And I was in a session. It was talking about the school to prison pipeline, and it was facilitated by some people who work here in Nashville. And as I tend to do when I'm at conferences at the end, I'll go up and thank the presenters. And he just looked at me and asked me, because I, you know, I was definitely in the minority in that group. And he's like, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I said, a lot of the problems you're talking about, high poverty, grandparents raising the children, you know, the parents are not in the picture. There's there's substance abuse, there's incarceration. It's like, those are the same things that are happening in my hometown too. And so wow. the the zip codes are different. The kids may look a little different. But the problems are essentially the same. And I think that that's something that a lot of people don't really realize. Yeah, for sure. So well, you took this job a year and a half ago, or you were mm-hmm. elected to this mm-hmm. job a year and mm-hmm. a half ago. What were some of your priorities and how has that been going for the last year and a half? So uh, thank you for asking. That's one of my favorite questions to answer. When I took this position, there were uh, I had several priorities. One, and I'm not going to list them in any order, so I don't want anybody to <laughs> misconstrue the order in which I <laughs> present these. But first of all, as a rural educator, uh, that is very near and dear to my heart. So rural education and, and having equitable opportunities is really important, making sure that my students aren't misjudged and their abilities aren't misjudged because of their test scores, because they don't have the same access to broadband and the same technology skills as, say, their counterparts in a more affluent school district. So really lifting up the challenges of rural education systems, that was a priority. Another priority is and has been engaging and supporting early career educators, aspiring and early career educators. We have a real crisis on our hands. And I I don't know that this is talked about enough in our state in in terms of our teacher pipeline and people going into the profession. One in five Tennessee educators has two or less years teaching experience. That is a jarring statistic. And I know what's happening. Well, there are a lot of factors contributing to, you know, when I went into teaching, my mom told me, now, Beth, these first couple of years, you're going to learn a lot more than your students. And I remember how offended I was because I worked really, really but hard. We covered but, this already, Beth. Right? Your mother Mom's is always all, right. But she's <laughs> always right. So, But I, as I reflect, you know, teaching is a craft. It's something that you get better at and you, you start to master certain things and that takes time. And we've created a system in our state that doesn't allow educators, early career educators to do that. Um, we've created a testing system that's related to their evaluations, where if they are not immediately producing students who are really good at taking tests, then they are labeled as ineffective or failing and they're, they're let go. We do not provide the mentoring support supports that our early career educators need. And we do not provide competitive wages when you're comparing teacher pay to pay of people who have similar uh, educational backgrounds and training. And so we've created this system where, you know, if you choose to go into this profession, you know, you're not going to get paid well, you're not going to be valued or respected by the community and and state at large. And you're going to be told, that you're a failure a lot of the times and about things that you can't control. You know, I, when I think about things that affect students' test scores, I always think of my student Gregory, because I taught high school English, so I did teach a tested subject. Gregory was in a car accident and he had a concussion and had to take my EOC. Now well, that you was have to, uh, the EOC end yeah. of course test. So it was the okay. state test at the end of the year. Oh, I sorry. Almost, it's okay. I almost <laughs> pulled out the jargon giraffe. Do you yeah, know I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Jargon giraffe is? Well, well, you can't see this, but I was like, wait a minute, EOC, yeah. jargon giraffe. So the end of yeah. course test. So um, Gregory had been in a car accident and had to come back to school to take the end of course test at the end of the year because it was part of his grade. It was part of my evaluation. Now, his test score, I don't remember what it was, but I'm telling you, it was not any indication of what he could do, what he had learned, or what I had done as his teacher. And yet we we have a system that perpetuates that, that does not take into account any of the barriers to student success and does not uh, take into account any real progress that students and and educators are making. So it's, it's, it's a disheartening profession to go into for people who are considering entering it for the first time now. And that's really hard for me to say because I love being a teacher. 
I love being an educator and I know that there are tens of thousands of educators across our state who feel the exact same way. And so for me to say, this is a really, really difficult job to get into, that hurts. But recent surveys show that the majority of Tennessee's teachers right now would not encourage their children to go into this profession. Oh, that's just heartbreaking. It is. It is. So the testing that you're referring to, is it TN Ready? Yeah, end of course test, TN Ready. They've renamed it a few times over right. the course of my And these are decisions that get yeah. made at the state level. Yes. And that's part of the reason why we're doing this, why we're talking to you today is mm-hmm. because there's so many decisions that get made at the state level and yet there are a lot of folks that they don't pay attention to what's happening here in Nashville at the legislative session, right? The sexy thing is the presidential race, which is really important. Don't get me wrong. But these issues that you're talking about, the devaluation of teachers as a profession, the testing requirements that are put on teachers that really make it almost impossible to, as you said, become a better teacher, right? And and it has an effect on the students too, right? Because they're, they're not really taught the critical thinking skills that might be needed outside of that testing. Uh, Vouchers is another big one that I think we need to spend uh, a good amount of time on because the Republicans in this state, under the direction of Bill Lee, who's a Republican governor, created this voucher program. It's a largely unspecified plan that allows taxpayer dollars to be given to parents to then be used towards private schools, basically private school tuition. Mm -hmm. The money is largely unmonitored. It would suck money out of our public schools, which is a problem on the face of it. Can you kind of tell us a little bit or walk us through some of the challenges and issues that vouchers will create for our state, our teachers, our students, our parents, and our public schools? Yes. Chewy question, right? Yes. (laughs) I may have to have you go back and relist some of those things. Well, just in your own words, just tell us about the voucher program. As president of the TEA, what does it mean to you and where do you see it going in this state? Okay. So the first thing, I would be remiss if if I did not share with your listeners that TEA has been fighting vouchers for years, Mm -hmm. (laughs) six, seven, eight years. I don't even know. I've lost count because we believe inherently that a voucher system is not helpful for public education in Tennessee. In fact, for the last several years, when we do polling in Democratic primaries, Republican primaries, general elections, we always include a question about vouchers. The language is super simple. It's not slanted to either pro-voucher stance or an anti-voucher stance. It's do you support the use of taxpayer dollars for private school tuition? Two to one, Tennesseans say absolutely not. When it is spelled out very, very plainly and you don't use flowery language, they say no. And so we have been fighting this issue for many, many years. You know, as I think back to last spring and watching events unfold as they did, I will never forget after sitting there watching the vote be held open for 45 minutes so then Speaker Cassida could get the 50th vote needed for the passage of the bill. I remember walking out on the steps of the legislative building and just hanging my head and thinking we have not had a single conversation this entire session about barriers to student success and how to overcome them. All we have talked about is money. We have not talked about students, what is keeping them from being successful and how we can solve that. Vouchers are not the answer. Vouchers are taking critical funds away from schools that need them the most, quite frankly, because as the voucher system is, we're going to see it in Tennessee, and we've modeled it after Arizona, which (laughs) in and of itself is a little bit frightening because Arizona has shown significant issues in the implementation of a voucher program. We raised concerns last spring when we were able to share data that talked about the misuse of funds that was evident in Arizona's voucher program. And then you are seeing now, just I think this week, reports that talk about how there are folks in the Arizona voucher program who are just hoarding that money. They're not actually spending it. They're amassing large bank accounts, so they're holding on to the money. And that's so the money, money is, that could be... The money is going from the Arizona state government because they've implemented a voucher program and checks are being written to families, to parents. Mm -hmm. And the parents are supposed to 
take their kid out of public school and use that money to pay for an alternative. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying here. They're taking their kid out of public school, but the money is just sitting in their bank account. Yeah, reports that we've been reading this week out of Arizona show that there are many cases where there are large amounts accruing in bank accounts that are unused for tuition. So, you know, I just think about how that money could be used. And I think one of my concerns, I won't say my biggest concern or whatever, one of my concerns particular and one of TEA's concerns about this week's meeting about the rules is we had this this vendor selected that was awarded a bid without an RFP process or a request for RFP request for, for proposal, proposal yeah. uh, request for proposal. There was no bid put out. So they were awarded this contract with no bid and the money allotted to pay for that bid was not included in the budget for last year. You know, we had about $770,000 allocated to help with the implementation in year one of the ESA voucher program. And yet we have just awarded a contract to Class Wallet. Uh, this is going to be about $1.25 million. So already we've gone beyond what the budget had allocated. There was no bid and there was no fiscal review. So the contract was awarded without anything going to the legislature, to the fiscal review committee to make sure that everything was kosher. So accountability, no. <laughs> Review, no. Just money, just being, yeah, okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And, you know, the thing, if, if the state had gone through a request for proposal and RFP process, we might have learned the, some of the concerns coming out of Florida. They have extensive experience with Class Wallet. And if you start researching that company, there are a lot of serious concerns about that particular vendor and Perhaps had we gone through an RFP, we might have been able to identify those. Uh, we might have been able to find a vendor who didn't have those particular issues. We would have been able to ascertain, yes, this is the best vendor or no, it's not. But, you know, really, it's not the vendor that's the biggest problem. The problem is we are taking money away from our public schools and sending them out without any accountability. So and, let's, yeah, and, let's just take a step back and, and go through this process again, because uh, I think it's important to put a really fine point on this. The TEA and teachers and parents and students have been fighting voucher programs, like you said, for years. I'm looking at a poster right now that said there's a rally for schools coming up March 16th, 2020 uh, at the steps of the Capitol. That happens every year. And for the last several years, there's been a, a focus on vouchers because the Republicans who want this have been trying to pass it session after session after session. Last year, at the end of session in 2019, it was a piece of legislation that goes through the process. It ended up on the House floor. And we had Glenn Cassida, who's the Republican Speaker of the House. He didn't have the votes, didn't have the votes, held the vote open for 45 minutes, and then he finally got that one vote that put it over the top. From what I remember, that vote was from a legislator who promised that vouchers wouldn't be implemented in his county. So the pilot program, I guess, for vouchers is Knox, is uh, Davidson County and Shelby County. Let's see how it works there yet. And this legislator voted yes because he was promised it wasn't going to go to Knox County. And I'm saying all this and really sort of reiterating what you so eloquently and passionately already said, again, because it's important that people know how important state level politics and getting the right people who align with the values of the people that are most important to the state. And teachers, they are responsible for our young people, right? They're handling the future. They should be treated like gold, right? They should have all the resources that they need. And the fact that this is another program that's sucking resources out of them, I think, is a reason for people to pay attention to what happens at the state level. So I, I would definitely agree with your statement that we need to be hyper focused on our state elections. We need to be encouraging, empowering, emboldening our citizens to vote. We have a philosophy, and we, we truly live by it here at TEA, that it's not about R, it's not about D, it's about E, it's about public education. And I, I cannot, in good conscience, not bring this up. We have a number 
of Republican friends in the General Assembly who support our public schools. We have a lot of rural Republican legislators who support our public schools, and I have to acknowledge that we had rural Republicans who voted against the voucher bill. And they did that because they believe in their public schools, and they knew that their constituents, their folks back home, did not want them to vote for vouchers. We had a really unfortunate uh, situation last year where we had a culture where legislators, for a variety of reasons, did not vote their district. The message was clear from their districts. We had members calling from all over the state telling us, I've called my legislator and I told them to vote no. If you go back and some of the folks we talked to over the General Assembly, they would tell you that in their offices they were getting calls 40 to 1, do not support this, do not vote for this. But they did not vote their district. And that's a whole, <laughs> that's a whole nother can of <laughs> well, worms. Well, while you but... were saying that, and I want to acknowledge what you're saying, because I think it's important. While you were talking, I was shaking my head yes, right? Like, because I agree with you. This should be about what's best for the students, but too often politics gets in the way. And unfortunately, the balance at the state legislature is what the problem is, right? It's overwhelmingly one side. And whenever you have one party that is overwhelmingly in power, what usually happens is the will of the people gets ignored and the most extreme kinds of legislation gets passed. And that's what we're in now, the environment that we're in now up at the state. Look into how your legislator is voting. I mean, I guess that's the main thing I can say, right? Look how your legislator is voting and just pay attention to what's happening on the state. If there was more of a balance with DNR at the state level, I think that more good things would happen for the people of the state. Well, I think that you can support public education regardless of your party. I'm an optimist by nature, and I have to be (laughs) in my profession. And as a leader, I have to be. And so I have to remind myself every morning that there are people who have the potential and capability of supporting their public schools. They just have to make the choice. And I think that that's one of the, the reasons that TEA is so excited about our rally for public schools that we're hosting on March 16th. This is not just an opportunity for educators to come make their voice known. This is an opportunity for students, for parents, for faith leaders, for school boards, for county commissions. Because when we talk about school funding, and you can't talk about vouchers without talking about school funding because vouchers divert funds away from from what our schools actually need. This is an opportunity for all Tennesseans to come to Nashville to stand with us in their red, we prefer, um, and say... Now, wait a minute. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, and, and say, our kids deserve better. Tennessee can afford it. You know, it's affordable. It's right. It's time to invest in our schools. We are 45th in the nation for public school funding. Our results are far better than what our funding is. Our Tennessee educators are getting the job done. Our students are working so very hard. And I just... Again, as an optimist, I can only imagine what our education outcomes could be if we were adequately resourced. And if we had funds for nurses and school counselors who could help deal with the adverse childhood experiences or the trauma that children bring into our classrooms that impedes their learning, Imagine how much better they would be able to perform academically. I sat down recently with a high school English teacher. Uh, I won't tell you what county because it's a rural district, but we were having dinner and she was literally, it was a Friday night. She was literally crying into her dinner and she was telling me the story about a student that she had just gotten this semester. And she said, this student is facing this trauma, this trauma, this trauma. For privacy, I'm not going to tell you what all they are, but she was just crying. She's like, how do I teach her? How do I teach her? Because she she's barely functioning in life. How do I teach her? She teaches English too, so she's going to have to take a test in May. Mm. You know, how do I teach her? And then I think about a kindergarten teacher that I talked to recently, and he was so upset. He said, I went to my principal. I asked for $107 to buy unit starters for my kindergarten students. And I was told we didn't have the money. $107. And then I think about the educators who are spending hundreds and some of them thousands. And I'd say our our educators who teach in the lower grades spend much more than I did as a high school teacher out of pocket. But they're paying for their own classroom supplies. This is an opportunity for educators and parents and everybody to come together and say the state has the money to do better. They are bound by the Constitution to do better. And it's time. We're sitting on millions of dollars in cash that we could be using to invest in our schools. We continue to take in revenue beyond what we're budgeting 
you know, and so let me just pause and explain that to your listeners, what this, what this feels like for me as an educator. When I think about my family budget, okay, let's say I get a raise. I'm taking in more income than I thought I was going to. But instead of feeding my kids three meals a day, I'm like, I'm still going to feed them two meals a day. And I'm just going to put that other away for a rainy day, whatever I might decide to do with it later. It's it's always good to have a savings account, but not at the expense of your kids. When your kids are starving, that's not a wise fiscal choice. And, you know, we have an opportunity in the state. We can continue to be fiscal conservatives. And I understand the pride that comes with that. And quite frankly, when I talk to educators across the state, they support being fiscally conservative and being smart with our money. But you have to balance the needs of our starving schools with building up a big reserve. And, and, you know, we can do it in Tennessee. We can do both. We can continue to be fiscally conservative and fiscally smart and still invest in our schools. And I think that's key, right? It's not about being fiscally conservative. It's about being fiscally responsible while you're taking care of the people that you need to take care of, like our students, right? And like our teachers, right? It's Conservative means to conserve, and I think that's exactly what they're doing. They're conserving at the expense of the the people of the state of Tennessee. So you could be responsible and you could still have money stashed away, like you mentioned, right? Like you could still have savings account, but not at the expense of, like you said, your family. So it's about being smart with the money. Well, we have a lot of ways that we can invest that money. You know, so we that talk was my about, next question. I'm so oh, good. Oh, you are so I'm good. I'm so good. So t- talk to me. What is your perfect... <laughs> system, educa- public education system look like, and I know that's hard, but, or what would you do? <laughs> that's a big question. How much longer do we have? Okay. Yeah. Beth, somebody gives you $750 million. What are you going to do with it? Okay. So I think the first thing that we have to acknowledge in the state of Tennessee is if we don't do something about educator salaries, oh, there are a lot of other things we won't have to talk about because we're not going to be able to open our school doors. I know that I live in a district and I just want to go on record saying I'm not hating on my district. They they have to make some very tough decisions like a lot of districts do. Which is why we're having this conversation. Right. They shouldn't have to make those tough but decisions. But, you know, when I was going around last legislative session in my first session as, as TEA president, I, I went to meet a lot of the legislators introduced myself, high school English teacher from Grundy County. And and we would get into talking about education issues. And a lot of them, both parties would say, well, you know, we've been sending you races. I'm like, yeah, I'm not getting them. And they're like, well, but we've been sending them. I said, I'm telling you that I've not been getting them. And and so there were a couple of things that I, I would share. I said, you know, where I live in Grundy County, I can drive 40 minutes in any direction hit about eight different districts and get anywhere from a $4,000 to a $10,000 raise and better benefits immediately. And let's talk about how bad that is for our kids, because we talked earlier about teaching being a craft. And so, you know, when you've got constant churn in your schools because your staff is always looking for somewhere that pays better, because quite frankly, they've got families at home that they've got to provide for, Mm. then you've got this churn in our schools where you don't have familiar faces in the hallways and in the classrooms, and you don't have those long established relationships with the community, and you don't have that experience that is so critical to student growth and student achievement that hurts our kids. So when we can't keep teachers in the classrooms because they're going elsewhere to get raises, that's a problem. You also have people who are leaving the profession entirely. And we talked about this earlier as well, where we have people who are not entering the profession because they can't earn a competitive wage. And so we have to talk about teacher salary. I say, I don't want to interrupt your train of thought, but I'm about to interrupt your train of thought. If the state government is earmarking money for raises and the teachers aren't getting it, where is it going? Okay, so thank you for asking that clarifying question because I think that's important. Okay, um, I'm glad yeah, I interrupted no, that. No, that's, that's a great <laughs> clarifying question. I don't believe districts are misspending the money. I think what we have is we have a system where our funding formula is not providing enough. The basic education plan, our funding formula for our schools, the BEP, does not adequately fund our schools. It does not provide all of the dollars needed to fund our schools. That's the the first step of the problem. And then we have unfunded mandates from the state where we have to offer response to intervention or RTI. And we have to have so many RTI teachers, but they're not funded. 
So we have a lot of unfunded mandates that come down that districts have to figure out how to deal with those. And so any extra monies that are coming down that might go into salaries are having to be diverted to meet the needs of our students. And so I'm not criticizing our local school boards or our county commissions. They're having to make some very tough decisions and and weighing the the needs of of educators versus students. And it's for a lot of them, it's a no win situation. Part of the problem is our state is a minority funder of education. And uh, we're one of the few states in the southeast who's a minority funder. We only fund like 46 or 47 percent of school budgets. And for a lot of districts like mine, we just don't have the tax base to compensate for that. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have the local income to offset that. And then you and I don't want to focus entirely on rural districts. Then you've got places like Davidson County and Shelby County where their percent from the state is even lower. And so going back to your voucher issue, when you talk about uh, programs like that, that's not just just the state dollars, that's local dollars that are having to leave the district. And so what's left are schools that don't have the resources they need. You wind up with overcrowded classrooms. You wind up with schools that don't have the technology they need or up-to-date curriculum. It's a real problem. Okay. So let's get you back on track. So teacher pay, Mm -hmm. we have to do something about teacher pay. What else? With the funding. Okay. So, or yeah, uh, or what would make a school serve a student in the best way and oh, be, yeah. Oh, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. At TEA, we like to talk about community schools, transformational community schools. And I don't know how familiar you are with community schools. I don't think many people are very familiar with the concept of a community school. But, you know, when we think about the founding of our country, the church and the school were the center. The schools have always been at the center of our communities. And the concept of a community school, uh, one, it recognizes that every community is very different. My hometown is going to be, it is not going to, it's not going to be, it is very different from, from Metro Nashville or even Sumner County or anywhere else in the state. It's very, very unique. And so community schools recognize that they build on the, the assets within that community. They identify what do we have What's special about our community and how can we use that to our advantage in educating our students? One of the most critical components in a community school is parent and community involvement in decision making and supporting what's happening at the school. Community schools also recognize that we cannot just be about meeting the academic needs of our students. We have to talk about their social, emotional, and mental well-being as as well. And so some of the hallmarks of a, a community school are those extra services that will help meet those needs, you know, whether it's partnership with uh, an optometrist in the community or a dentist in the community who, you know, two days a, a month will take care of the students in the school who need who need that, mm. you know, because when you think about truancy or absenteeism, a lot of it's related to health issues. Community schools can also work with community partners to address things like food insecurity housing insecurity. And so in a perfect world, in Beth's perfect world, we create spaces for these community schools where we're building on what's really wonderful about that community. We're bringing everybody together into this joint venture of educating our children and meeting the needs that are there. The word holistic comes to mind. It's a very much a holistic approach. I tried not to, I deliberately tried not to use the phrase whole child because people don't really understand what that is, but it is a whole child approach. It's right. it's addressing the, the physical, the mental, the emotional, social needs of the students in the communities. And there's a movement afoot for these community schools right now? Well, So we have had a couple of community, well, we've had a few community schools in the state of Tennessee for several years, started um, several years ago out in the Knoxville area with Pond Gap Elementary. TEA worked for a few years to get a community schools bill passed because we do see this as addressing those barriers to student success. In my opinion, community schools are the answer because they break down all of those barriers Mm -hmm. or they can if they're, they're operating correctly. And so we worked very hard. It took us about three years, I think, to get a bill passed last session that uh, made community schools an option to state takeover. And so I'm hopeful that we're going to see some movement this session on expanding, improving our community schools language in the law. 
Well, good luck. That sounds, yeah, that sounds amazing. It's it's pretty exciting. Yeah. It's nice to to work for something and not always <laughs> <laughs> fighting off the ugly. <laughs> yeah. Um, before we close, and I want to give you an opportunity to address anything that you want to, but the state of the state is Monday. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people don't know that just like the State of the Union happens with the President of the United States here in Tennessee and in most states, we have a state of the state where the governor is invited to address a legislative body. And mm-hmm. it's it's actually broadcast on somewhere, I think, government TV channels. And, um, and, and obviously, you can watch it online. To the best of your knowledge, is Governor Lee going to address education in the state of the state this Monday? Well, I would be totally shocked if he didn't talk about education in some way. I can tell you what TEA hopes to hear. Okay. We hope to hear a pledge for significant investment in Tennessee's public schools. We want to see an investment from the governor and from our General Assembly of what they actually can afford, not just something to placate and Mm -hmm. say, well, we invested in schools, but... Let's talk about real investment. Let's talk about an investment that's going to move us up from the 45th education funding ranking, which is where we currently sit in the nation. Let's talk about an investment that moves us to the Southeast regional average. You know, when we talk about our rally on March 16th, you know, TEA has been engaged in a two-year campaign to accomplish two goals. We call it our 2020 vision campaign. One is to increase uh, per pupil funding to at least the regional average by the year 2020, and the other is to to eliminate the use of high stakes decisions based on standardized tests by the year 2020. That those two goals have been guiding our work mm-hmm. for set. Well, we adopted the goals in 15. We launched our 2020 campaign in 2018. So we have been working to accomplish these goals for many, many years. So TEA hopes to hear, I hope to hear as a Tennessee educator, I hope to hear my governor say, we are going to invest in Tennessee's public schools in a way that moves us out of the bottom 10 and in a way that gets us to that regional average because there's not a student in Tennessee who does not deserve the same kind of funding as our students in North Carolina and Kentucky and Georgia and all these other places are getting. I hope I hope to hear that from my governor. I also hope to hear from the governor serious conversations about barriers to student success and truly and meaningfully addressing the issues of student trauma and 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 the secondary trauma that our educators are feeling because that has not been part of the conversation by and large. I think we're starting to hear some rumblings over in the Cordell Hall building about okay, we've got to talk about uh, adverse childhood experiences. We've got to talk about that. But we also have to talk about the trauma that our teachers are taking home every single day. And so mental health is I want to hear that as a priority as well. So teachers, by and large, are empathetic mm-hmm. humans. It's probably why they go into that. So you mentioned your friend earlier mm-hmm. who was crying over her dinner. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, how long can you handle that, going into an environment where that just breaks your heart every day? Well, it, it is it is super difficult. And when you, when you add that to the other challenges mm-hmm. of being a member of this profession, it's why a lot of people are leaving. A lot of educators do not feel that they have the support that they need to be successful. And... Nobody wants to be in a job where you can't be successful. And when we go into this profession because we love children and we want to help children and we want to inspire children and we can't do that, we aren't equipped and our schools aren't resourced to do that. I'm a high school English teacher. I am not a counselor by trade. I cannot meet those needs as a high school English teacher, I would have on average 150 students a day. Well, let's just say 10% are dealing with some sort of trauma and trauma can vary. I mean, and it can vary from year to year for kids. And so that is a lot that your educators are internalizing because those are their kids, you know, and going back to testing, it impacts kids' performance on tests and then teachers are evaluated by that. And they can't control the types of trauma that our kids are bringing into the classroom. And it's very different than it was 20 years ago when I started teaching. So I, I hope we hear from the governor, we're going to do not only a historic investment, but we're going to do an investment that is going to really move the needle. It's going to make a difference. It's going to move Tennessee out of the bottom 10. It's going to get us to the regional average in per pupil investment. I hope to hear the governor talking about student mental health and the way we can start breaking down some of the barriers to student success. I think those would have to be the the top two priorities for me as a Tennessee educator and for the TEA as an organization. Well, we will see. 
We will. I will be there. <laughs> yes. In my red. <laughs> Well, Beth, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining uh, the Tennessee Democratic Party podcast. If you don't know, now you know. Any last words? Well, I would just reiterate my invitation to all Tennesseans to come out to our rally Monday, March 16th at the Legislative Plaza. We'll start right at 12, get there about 1130. It's going to be a great opportunity for Tennesseans to celebrate the great things that are happening in our public schools every single day in Tennessee. It's going to be a great opportunity for us to come together and advocate for the resources that our students and that our educators and our schools deserve. And it's going to be a great opportunity to tell our our elected officials, stand with us now so we can stand with you in November back at home when we vote. Well, that's a perfect way to end this podcast. You are awesome. (laughs) Thank Thank you. you, Beth. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thanks for listening. You can find out more about the show at tndp.org slash podcast. Follow us on Instagram at T-E-N-N Democratic Party and on Twitter at T-N-D-P. This show is distributed by We Own This Town. And don't forget to check to make sure you're still registered to vote at sos.tn.gov. If you're not registered, you can go there and do that too. So do it. <laughs>